Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Preedy. In today's episode, we're going to cover the exposure draft on primary financial statements. And to help me through that, I'm joined by, he's back with us, the amazing, the better, Gary Berkowitz. I don't know what you're better than, but I'm just. I was going to say, Ruth, I'm back. I I wouldn't necessarily say I'm better, but I'm back. That that, that one out of two is correct. (laughs) Surely every day we're a bit better. We've learned something new. And today you're going to teach us about a very exciting topic, primary financial statements. That's got to be important, surely. Well, yeah, it's got the word primary in it, so it must be important, right? (laughs) Number one. (laughs) So, for those people that haven't read the 2052 pages that was published, could you give us a high level of the objective, first of all, what the project's trying to do? Yeah, sure. So, I think that the objective of the project and the board is, I guess, to improve how information is communicated in the financial statements with a focus on information in the in the, in the the statement of profit or loss, so as this old school people like me call it, the income statement. So, although this is primary financial statements, the, the real focus of this is on the, the income statements and related notes. And I think there's really far focus areas that um, that the board is looking at here. Uh, the one was requiring additional subtotals and in income statements. Uh, the second one was requiring separate presentation of uh, what they've called uh, integral associates and joint ventures. So making it clearer how you, how you earn income from uh, associates or joint ventures who may be integral to your businesses. Uh, Further disaggregation, both uh, on the face of the income statement and in the notes. So giving us some more disaggregation principles around uh, your expenses uh, by functional nature and a requirement to disaggregate large other balances and also a disaggregation of information about unusual income or expenses, which we'll probably talk about a bit later, um, and some additional minimum line items on the statements of the financial position. And the last two things is really just requiring some disclosure of uh, management defined performance measures, which again is probably something we'll talk about a little bit later, and then some limited changes to the to the cash flow statement to improve um, consistency uh, in classification by removing some options. So that's very high level, but as you said, people are welcome to read the, the 50,000 pages if they want the, the detail. I think they're just 20 minutes is going to be enough to get them through, I think. Um, it's so good. So we've got really focus on the income statement, a little bit of cash flow there as well. And you've given us the high level areas. What actually drove this project? What was the problem they were trying to address? Yeah, so I think this started out, I think, well, way back in kind of 2014, 2015, when the primary financial statements as a whole, the project was added to the board's research agenda. And then in, I think, the, the 2015 agenda consultation was reinforced the view that primary financial statements should be a high priority for the board. And so this this project is really trying to address three key needs from from users and the one was that you know the structure and content of the financial statements varied amongst entities so this is really a consistency challenge and so we know today there's a lot of flex what we'll call flexibility in the income statement but i think some users felt that they would welcome some defined subtotals to improve comparability Uh, the second thing is that users said they wanted to see more more disaggregation of the information in the financial statements so that they had a better insight into into the operations of the company and the third thing is that users said they find you know the management defined performance measures which we sometimes call non-gap measures or apms they find them useful in analyzing forecasts about future performance but uh, entities often are providing these 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 performance measures without explaining their intended purpose So when you you mentioned there that this project's been going on since 2014, what's the current stage? Yeah, that's a good question. So as I mentioned, I think back in 2014, you know, the board looked at primary financial statements as a whole. This is really the focus on the the income statements and some related notes. And uh, the exposure draft, as you mentioned, was issued in December 2019. So as you know, an exposure draft is when we're, we're getting a lot closer to issuing a final standard. Uh, that exposure draft originally had a six-month comment period, so it would have would have ended on the 30th of June. Um, but as folks know, as a result of, of coronavirus and uh, folks generally needing to change focus over that period, the board very um, helpfully extended the, the comment deadline. And so if you missed the 30 June deadline, the good news is that it's extended uh, to the end of September. So the deadline for comments on the exposure draft is the 30th of September. And uh, thereafter, the board will obviously assess the, the feedback and, and potentially move to a final, a final standard. Perfect. So 
don't panic everyone you've not missed the uh, deadline you got till september perfect okay so let's get into you mentioned some juicy stuff there come on management performance measures unusual mm -hmm. items that's got to be exciting let's start at the top with the focus presentation of the income statement what are the proposals there yes maybe some of the highlights the key things that the board has done is that they've they've split the the income statement into kind of three main categories so they've said you've got an operating category, which is really trying to capture all of your core operating income and expenses. Then you've got an investing category, which will capture things that are not really core to, to operating, but they're more standalone investments that can generate kind of cash returns on their own. And then you've got a financing category, which is kind of your borrowings and, and the related kind of uh, costs and income related to that. And the way that they've defined that is by, or they've, they've done that is by defining financing and investing activities and they've said anything that isn't a financing or investing activity by default is then an operating activity and so you've got three main new categories they've got some some mandated subtotals so you'll now actually have a mandated subtotal for operating profit because as we know that's actually a key key metric for many and so that's probably going to be helpful you'll have another mandated subtotal which is um, you know operating profit before financing and tax uh, I think I mentioned up front in your income statement now you're going to have a separate section on your income from integral associates and joint ventures, which actually then sits within more within the operating category. So you've got kind of your operating category before your integral JVs and associates, then you'll have your integral JVs and associates to give you kind of your, your operating uh, category as a whole before you move on to investing and financing. They've also reiterated a principle of not mixing function and nature. So folks may recall in your income statement, you can prepare an income statement by the function of items or by the nature of the associated uh, income and expenses. And over time, you know, folks have, have maybe ended up mixing it a little bit in an attempt to try and provide more useful information. And I think the board is trying to reset the bar there and say, you know, if you've determined that, you know, functions the best income statements or nature, you shouldn't mix the two, the two types together. And again, one of the highlights I mentioned, there's a lot more on disaggregation and, and the disaggregation principle. And I think, again, yeah, the board has done some good work on saying this is when you should disaggregate uh, items of income and expense and looking at the characteristics of those income and expenses to try and work out when you should disaggregate uh, disaggregate the items. So that's I guess, some of the highlights related to presentation of the income statement. Perfect. So a good message there for us to remember, not mixing up by function, by nature. And I think the ED as well proposes like how you might make the judgment about whether you should use by function or nature. And you mentioned there they're going to divide the income statement into operating, investing and financing. I feel like they have heard those subtotals before in the cash base statement. Are they <laughs> the same definitions? I'm being yeah. cheeky here. Same. It's a, no, 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 Different. that's a good question. I, th I think they, 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 that's a, it's a really difficult one because they aren't, they aren't, there isn't direct cohesiveness or correlation between the income statements and the cash flow statements. So I think it's intended to give you the same type of, of activities. But for example, this is the one that I like to use. If you think of when you buy an item of PPE, uh, that will generally go into the investing category in your cash flow statement. But when you depreciate that PPE, it's going to go in the operating uh, category of your of your income statement. So although the headings are the same, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have the same types of items that you can get a direct correlation with between the cash flow statement and the income statement, which, you know, again, personally is, is some of the challenge I have with you using the same headings. But um, they are they, 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 they aren't intended to be a direct correlation to the cash flow statement, I would say. OK. Perfect. And then I mentioned up front one of the juicier ones, I say, is, is this concept of unusual income and expense. And my automatic question is, what on earth is unusual? <laughs> and what does the what does ED say there? Yeah, it's a great question, Ruth. And I guess unusual is in the eye of the beholder. And I, I guess how long is a piece of string? The phrase springs to mind. And I think that's that's some of the like challenges. I, I think, think I'm usual, Gary, but <laughs> some people might argue differently. <laughs> uh, I think I think you're extraordinary, so you're definitely not you. Oh, but, Gaza. <laughs> uh, um, but I think I think the way the board has defined uh, unusual items is they've 
uh, of income and expenses is that they've defined them as items that have limited predictive value. And I think the definition that they've gone with in the exposure draft is that they are uh, income and expenses have limited predictive value when it's reasonable to expect that the income or expenses that are similar in type and amount will not arise for several future annual reporting periods. Now, I, I didn't know that off by heart. I did read that out, if you're wondering. But, um, you know, I think that is the definition that they've they've provided. And then provided that you meet that definition, you aren't allowed to present them on the, generally present them on the face of your income statement. You will be putting them in the notes to your income statement with a narrative description of why these items are unusual. And I think to be fair to the, to the board, this is in response to to the very definitions and presentation alternatives that companies have used in the past when trying to explain to users their recurring or their core kind of earnings. And so the ISB is, is trying to be helpful here by driving consistency um, of what, what probably is an important measure. However, you know, you'll have realized as I was reading that definition, there are probably a number of judgments that are going to go into determining whether or not something is an, an unusual item. So if you just break down what I said in the definition, you know, an entity needs to assess whether it, might be, it would be reasonable to expect the related income or expense to occur. An entity needs to consider whether the related income or expense is similar in type or nature to other income or expenses that might occur in the future. An entity needs to consider whether the related income or expense is similar in amount to the income or expense that might occur in the future. And finally, an entity also needs to consider how many accounting periods several future annual reporting periods is intended to cover. So you probably pick up from what I'm saying that I have some concerns around whether or not the uh, the wording as it's currently drafted will achieve the objective, but it is a, a good objective to, to be fair to the board. Perfect. So if you had, for example, restructuring costs every year, they maybe wouldn't fit into that definition. You may struggle to justify why restructuring costs every year continue to be uh, unusual. But I guess that's the question around, you know, if you think of the current environment that, that folks have had to incur expenses from a COVID-19 COVID perspective, you know, is it reasonable to expect that those costs are not going to recur in the next several mm -hmm. reporting periods? I think that kind of already puts a bit of pressure on, you know, is this thing really operable? But again, as I say, we'll see where the boards get to. They'll probably get some comments on that and, and we might get some refined wording. But as I say, I, from a personal level, I guess I'm supportive of the of the objective. I'm just I'm not sure we might get there with the current wording. Perfect. So then next topic, which I should think people be interested in the in the ED is around management performance measures, which I suppose I would have assumed is non gap measures. But I think there's probably a bit slightly tighter definition of uh, NPM. So can you explain to us what they're trying to get to there? Sure. And again, yeah, this is, as I mentioned before, in response to kind of a users or investors request to say we all know the the use and proliferation of, of management performance measures in financial statements and financial reports is increasing in an, in an effort to provide users with more useful information. And so again, I think the board has stepped up to the plate here and said, okay, well, it would probably be helpful if there was maybe a little bit more rigor around uh, how, these, how these numbers are calculated and a little bit more in terms of the reconciliation of these numbers back to, to amounts that are IFRS in nature. And so the, the way they've done that is, as you, you, you rightfully said, Ruth, they've, they've, def, they've provided a definition. And so management performance measures are, are subtotals of income or expenses that are used in public communications outside financial statements. And they complement totals or subtotals of IFRS. And they're used to communicate to users of financial statements management's view on an aspect of the entity's financial performance. So that's really what we're trying to get at uh, with, with management performance measures. And so if you kind of fast forward through all of that, what does it mean? It means you might have a situation where um, you go to the notes in the financials and you're able to see that management use this definition of core operating profit in their in their press release. And if you try and reconcile that core operating profit to the operating profit number that you're now going to see in your in your new income statements, there is a reconciliation that explains very clearly how you get back to the IFRS numbers, what adjustments management's made and why they made those adjustments. 
just to help users understand, do I really want to use this NPM? Is it really achieving what, what management says it should be achieving? So just to understand, it's only if they meet that definition that they effectively appear in the financial statements. Obviously, people will use other measures that aren't based on a subtotal in the financial statements, but they can still keep all of their non-GAAP stuff in the front half, can't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, well, depending on the regulators, view on it, obviously, but I mean, we can't, IFRS is just really trying to incorporate some of those NPMs into the financial statements to provide a little bit more rigor and, and uh, uh, potentially uh, consistent disclosure around the reconciliation of those items back to IFRS numbers that people do know how they were how they were determined. But I mean, you raise a good point there, Ruth, which is it, it really doesn't capture all of your management performance measures. And that's maybe one of the, one of the challenges that the, the board might want to consider depending on how folks respond, which is it's really only capturing subtotals that are specified in, in, in IFRS standards. And so it, 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 it might miss, for example, um, revenue, revenue uh, in constant currency, for example, or certain ratios that are keyed off cash flow information. And I think, you know, there's maybe a, a question if folks are interested and they think it's a good idea, you know, does the board want to maybe expand it and say, you know, it should be based on anything that's got a direct link back to the financial statements. But I guess at the moment, the board have incorporated some NPMs as a question around you know, is, is that enough or is it too many in some folks' views, perhaps? Perfect. And then moving on then from NPMs, the other thing you mentioned up front is right, this maybe this concept of focusing on more disaggregation. How does that come out as some of the stuff in the ED? So I think that how it comes out is that the, the board has tried to be very clear on the principle of aggregation and disaggregation, when, when an entity should aggregate and when they should disaggregate. And I think, again, you know, there's some really helpful stuff um, around disaggregation where the board has, has provided application guidance that says, when you're thinking about disaggregation, think about how the item of income or expense arises, as well as the characteristics of the underlying income or expense. So I found that actually really helpful uh, when I looked at that. And it's an area where it would be really nice if the board actually maybe expanded on that concept to say, when you're thinking about whether or not you should group items, think of their characteristics. And they've got a good example in the in the exposure draft where they say, you know, you might have two items that are both measured at fair value, but the one item relates to an underlying uh, debt instrument and the other, other item relates to an underlying equity instrument. And so although they're both measured at fair value, which may be a characteristic, the underlying risks related to those two investments might be very different because the one is debt in nature and the other one is equity. So in my mind, you know, that's a really helpful uh, principle to think about when you're thinking about whether or not you should, you should break things up or disaggregate them a bit more. I think there is potentially a risk, though, that, that the pendulum is maybe swung back a little bit to disaggregation. That, that's really where the focus is. If you think the, the board and, and, and others have done a lot of good work over the last several years in trying to ensure that we, we reduce the clutter. And I think there's maybe a risk that there's maybe a little bit too much focus on disaggregation now on the ED, but uh, let's let's see where they ultimately get to. And just one other point on that to touch on, that obviously when you look at a set of financials, there's sometimes other categories. So I don't know, you might look at payables and they've spit out all their material payables and then they have other payables, which I assume is a bunch of immaterial balances. There's something around that in the ED as well, isn't there? This yeah, and that's to the, to the point that I made. To the point that I made about about disaggregation, maybe the pendulum swinging too far in the one direction. Because uh, I think there's a requirement now to say, look, if you have got an other category in terms of disaggregation, you need to disclose what actually compromises that other category. And I guess there's a, there's a risk there that if the whole idea is it's made up of a whole lot of immaterial balances that that don't share uh, any any specific criteria that you could have grouped them to, together before, we're not sure what informational value that might provide to investors. But again, one for folks to be aware of, you know, as it's currently worded, uh, if it goes through as worded, you, you might need to provide some additional disclosure on on how on how you've constituted that other balance that makes up uh, what's generally all the immaterial amounts. It's a little bit more onerous. Perfect. And I should say sorry in advance to Gary here because I've given him a defined list of questions I was going to ask him, and I've totally gone off piece and asked exactly the questions I wanted to know. So sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> no, that's very fine. Very good. Comes across as nice and natural, Ruth. <laughs> Oh, I'm just being nosy. So just coming towards the end of the podcast now, we've obviously, there's loads of questions in the exposure draft and we haven't covered all of them. So is there anything else that's sort of really key that you think people will be interested in? Maybe maybe one thing to just highlight to reiterate, Ruth, which um, when I spoke about the three different categories, uh, you know, operating, investing and financing, 
I think as I, I maybe made, was too too uh, blasé about it when I said, you know, there's definitions of how you get into investing or financing and everything else by default goes into operating. If you think of, for example, an entity like a bank, there's also specific guidance in there that says, yeah, you should put stuff deep by default into financing if it meets these characteristics, unless it's part of your main business activities, in which case it can continue to be shown in operating. And similarly for maybe an investment entity or an insurance company who does a lot of investing, um, even though those would by default meet the investing category because they're part of your main business activity, they'd go in operating. And I think it's probably worthwhile if, if folks do have type of you know financing or investing activities that you think is part of your main business activity, just have a read of the words in the standard and make sure that the way that the board has defined main business activity in terms of financing and investing uh, gets you to the outcome that you think makes sense for your business. Because I think at the moment, the, the definitions around what's the main business activity from an investing or a financing act, uh, activity might be quite quite difficult to apply and we might need a couple more a couple more words there before we're comfortable with all of those. Perfect. Okay, so we hopefully we've brought out some of the key points that are in the ED and you mentioned up front and um, we're obviously in the comment comment period stage so if anyone does feel strongly about any of that or it's got them excited and they want to read the whole document it's all on the ISB website and just remind us Gary deadline as it's changed. September 2020 yeah. That's 30 September deadline. and then they'll collate all the comment letters and it will go back to board discussion about what they're going to do with it. Correct yeah that's it. Brilliant well thank you very much for coming back Gary. It's nice not to talk about COVID and impacts on accounting for once. Yeah, <laughs> Let's talk about something definitely, different. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you require any more information on that, like I said, the actual full exposure draft is on the ISB website and comment period 30th of September. So thank you very much for listening. Stay safe and happy accounting. The preceding programme was brought to you by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.